Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. (laughs) All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content, and we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our miniseries, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. What a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get... All episodes ad-free, that's the whole back catalog, plus future episodes, and twice monthly there's going to be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions. So people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders, and uh, you get a whole lot more of Paul, America's PCP. (laughs) You know, Paul, we're, we're in Hershey, Pennsylvania, And Paul, I don't know if I've talked about this before, but I had a real problem with uh, chocolate and nuts and marshmallows. And, uh, but Paul, I got over it, but it it was a rocky road. (laughs) They're going to rescind my job offer. (laughs) All right, uh, let's let's get started. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. And the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about HIV. Uh, you know, what should we be, what should we know about this as generalists in primary care? And we have a great guest, Dr. J.J. Nunez. Paul, before we introduce our wonderful guest, would you tell people, what is it that we do on The Curbsiders? Yeah, I, I often ask myself, but thank you, Matt. Uh, and also, by the way, thank you, um, John, for that nice introduction. I have never been introduced first in my entire life, by the way, so that was a real thrill <laughs> for me. Um, it's nice to have that recorded for posterity. We are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And what an expert we have for you. I can say on a personal note, I've known um, Dr. Nunez for years, and he is one of those people who is like annoyingly good. I don't know if you know people like that, but like he's nice and then also competent and takes good care of patients and is smart and the type of person who makes you feel bad about yourself, if you're me at least. So we're thrilled to have him, but I'll give a more formal bio now. Um, So Dr. Nunez received his medical degree from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and went on to do his internal medicine residency at Yale New Haven Medical Center and completed his fellowship in infectious disease at the University of Pennsylvania with Penn Medicine. Dr. Nunez is interested in health equity and medical education. In addition, he has an interest in improving access to medications for opioid use disorder, medical and Resident, medical and resident education, medical student resident education that was probably supposed to be, HIV primary care and HIV preventive medicine. So without further ado, let's bring up Dr. Nunez. JJ. All right, let's, <laughs> let's get right to a case, right down to business. All right. JJ, we're going to tell you about Mr. Jones. He's a 24-year-old gentleman, uh, self-identifying male, who presents to your primary care office for the establishment of care. He is transferring care to your office after moving to your city from out of state. Medical records are not available at this visit. He is without specific somatic concerns. Um, and he reports a medical history significant for HIV, for which he takes uh, Bictegravir, Emtricitabine, and Tenofovir, otherwise known as Bictarbi. And for the purposes of this case, um, you're not an expert. You are me, which means you are well-meaning and you don't have a lot of experience in care of HIV, but you're you're ready to, ha- but you have ready access to competent colleagues like yourself who are able to do so. So, and I feel like th- one of the reasons I chose this case is this comes up. In my practice, I don't know about you, Wado, a lot where I have someone who say their HIV is well managed by uh, an ID doc, but they still want somebody else for their primary care. And it's the lines get kind of blurred and I, I feel like I need a little bit of help. But for you, at a first visit like this, where you're meeting this patient for the first time, what are, what are your goals and what does this first conversation look like for you? Yeah, so I, I think usually when I'm first seeing any new patient, I kind of always try to break the ice. I kind of introduce myself. Mostly I try to tell them two things. I'm slow. So like I, I'm like molasses. <laughs> So I, I usually tell them pri- probably don't want to schedule an appointment after that, mostly because it gives me time to really dive into a little bit of the psychosocial stuff that's necessarily go going on. Second thing I always tell them, I'm like Columbo. So I tend to repeat myself a lot. And mostly I feel like it's mostly just to pick up things that might not have come up the first time or maybe I have n- did not actually pick up when they were talking. So I think from the first visit, I really try to get a sense of what brought them here today. You know, if they're transferring their care, what was the reason that they're transferring care? Was there barriers to the last practice that they were necessarily at? 
You know, I think the other things, if they're moving from a different state, what brought them to the state? You know, are they, is it work? Is it employment? I feel like starting off with some of those questions gives me a little bit more about the social support as I try to ask um, these questions um, overall. Um, then during the actual visit, I think focusing a little bit more on the HPI, mostly of HIV, the big things I'm looking for mostly is, you know, time of diagnosis. How long have they been diagnosed? Are they actually on medication? Are they taking their medication? Are they struggling with adherence? Um, those are the kind of the questions I'm necessarily asking overall, mostly to kind of think about barriers to care. Um, I think we do an excellent job of screening patients for HIV. It's just retaining patients in care, where it's a little bit dip more difficult. I, I noticed you mentioned Colombo. Uh, I'm 40 years old and I barely get that reference, so I'm sure your <laughs> patients really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, but I... I, I wanted to ask about, um, you, you mentioned psychosocial things, um, is like how, now, now I'm, uh, now I threw myself off here, Paul. Um, <laughs> it's a solid joke though. It was <laughs> worth it. <laughs> I, I just really wanted to make the Colombo joke. No, but, uh, at, at that first visit, um, how much, how much time are you getting and, and how much detail are you getting into about like this? You, you mentioned the psychosocial stuff. So can you give an example of like where you might spend the time on those? Sure. Like wh which specific issues? Sure. I think usually I start off with just asking about the social history in the beginning, um, really getting a chance to learn my patients. It makes it easier for me to remember who they are, especially when they're calling. Yeah. So I can really remember one or two special facts um, necessarily about them. But I think the things I'm really focusing on is, you know, living situation, you know, Things about, you know, how they interpret and look at their disease. How do they feel about their disease? Um, you know, how do they feel about their medication management? You know, these are, are there things where they feel that they're empowered? Or they feel like they're being listened to? Um, those are some of the things I'm actually necessarily going through as well. A as I focus on that, I'm also just trying to figure out if there's issues with housing or if there's issues with, you know, changing insurance or making sure that there's coverage for the medications. Um, are they having trouble with side effects or any reportable side effects that I don't know about medications? So as I go through with that, I also try to focus a little bit more on um, mental health, just to try to see where they're necessarily at. You know, have they been treated before in the past for any uh, mental health? Are they having any barriers right now? So a lot of times I think of it as more like a biopsychosocial assessment than necessarily like a true like social history, actually. And then that's way I kind of segue and make that introduction to kind of the more personal questions. I don't usually like to start off with just the HIV questions because sometimes they can be a little bit more personable or intrusive. So then I kind of move into the history of like when they were diagnosed, where they've been diagnosed. A couple of questions I might focus on for that is, you know, have they been on medications that worked for them? Or have they been on medications that hadn't worked for them? Are there any side effects for me to know about? You know, what did, what do they look for in a provider? Those are the things I kind of focus on um, during the visit. Usually, I have about 40 to 60 minutes for new patients, which is uh, lovely. Also run slow, so it's going to be a little bit longer than that. Um, in my practice, you know, there's days I have social worker and case managers, so I think we're all working together as they work with the patients, and I think to, at the end, we try to debrief and see if there's any issues that we might have missed. Other days, I'm just by myself. I, I feel like the first visit is really a job interview. That's really what it is for me. Um, I got to make sure that this patient feels comfortable to come back. No one really wants to go to the doctor. I don't want to go to the doctor. The only thing I'm more popular than maybe the dentist. Okay. Um, but I feel like I, how much I try to focus on that visit, you know, I might have my expectations, but it's really measuring what expectations my patient have. If there's an ongoing issue or medical concern that they have, I'm going to push some of that aside and really just focus on that. Because I think one of the big things is trying to retain them in care is making sure that we're taking care of the, the issues that they have. This, I mean, all this is exactly, you're led nicely to the next question about retention and care. And this is sort of a broad question, but I guess other than being your usual charming, excellent Dr. Lee self, is there any sort of systemic or sort of like clinic level stuff that you can do to encourage retention and care? And I guess what, what, what can we do to keep these people engaged in treatment? Because I know that there's, um, this can be a challenge at yeah, times. Yeah, I feel like I, I, jumping around in a lot in the sense that, you know, I, I mentioned what I do. I think the first thing I, I also make sure is just making sure that we're using 
right pronouns. So, so, you know, for some of my patients, you know, it might be fluid. So I might ask during each particular visit. So I think that might be one part where I would start. I think one of the big things that I, I try to make sure during the visit is ways I can contact my patient. There was a study that was done at one of the Ryan Wright conferences, I want to say like years ago, that was one of the biggest predictors was change in phone number in a year. Oh, wow. So I think for me, trying to focus out where they're at, where I can contact them, how I can contact them, recognizing, especially for my younger adolescent um, or young adult patient population, you know, cell phone calling them is archaic. They, they, no one calls them, right? So it's like usually through text. So I try to find other ways in theirs um, as well. I think the other thing systemically I try to do is tr see them without medical records. If I have it, lovely, awesome. If it's not, that's fine too. I don't find that they're overall super helpful. You get 200 pages of stuff that you don't necessarily need. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's it's helpful, more helpful if you have like a specific question when you get that 200 page document dump of like prior prior records. But I, I wanted to point out to the audience because I, I think about this a lot. I, I, I'm i a doctor, but I, I try to read and listen to stuff that's like way outside of medicine and try to apply it to medicine. But I think like if you're in the audience and you don't see anyone who has HIV, I think a lot of what you talked about is just good doctoring where you're just like, I start off, I want to get it like details about the person so I remember who they are. Like I remember their story. You're building like your memory palace of like who is this person. Um I think that's I think that's great. So uh I think people can apply that to to whatever they're doing, um, even if they're not seeing any HIV um in their clinic. And you you mentioned some of the things, but I, I wonder if you could just sort of role model for us what your specific HIV history looks like. So once you have the patient comfortable with you in terms of things like um date of diagnosis and sort of acquisition, like, are there any, and prior, med I think you touched on most of those points, but if you could just sort of bullet point out what you kind of ask about when you're asking about the HIV history specifically. Yeah, sure. So I, I try to figure out where they're necessarily coming from, when they were diagnosed, if they've ever been hospitalized or non-hospitalized, that gives me an idea if there's been complications. Um, usually I, I go back to see if they've been on history of any opportunistic infections, so it can kind of give me an idea what stage of HIV or AIDS or complications they might have had before in the past. You know, medications we talk about, I really want to make sure that we're aware of um, resistance, which most patients may not necessarily know. They just may remember, hey, this medication I was told does not work for me overall. I want to get a sense if they have an understanding of what the name of their medication is. Realistically, they're probably going to know more about their medication than some of the providers. We just don't see it as often. And then what pharmacy that they've been using it? How have they been getting it? Um, have they had any issues for the barriers for the pharmacy? Because sometimes if it's smaller mom and pop shops, the medication can sometimes be delayed for getting it compared to some of the bigger um, institutions. Um, as for additional um, HIV history, you know, other things I try to get a sense of as well as any other co-infections, uh, mostly thinking about hepatitis B and hepatitis C because it's going to determine what I do for treatment. And then want to make sure that we really treat hep C very early on because with co-infection, the progression to liver disease is much higher. Um, I also want to make sure there's social support. Actually, so just making sure like as we're working about things, you know, just, uh, are there people aware of their diagnosis? Or are they not aware of their diagnosis? Are they secretive about their diagnosis? Stigma. The way I ask that's mostly like what's been barriers for you about, you know, taking care of your medical condition, actually. Paul and I were talking about this uh, on the drive up up here. I, I mean, it. I feel like that it's it's a chronic disease. We have such good treatment for it. But the stigma and people just remember the 80s and the 90s when everyone was dying from it and people are still just so secretive about it. Or I've still had patients tell me, please don't test me for HIV. I'm like, Why don't, what are you worried about getting tested? And they're like, I just don't want to, I don't even want to go there. I'm like, well, it's a chronic disease. Like you could get treated. And so I, I think there's still a lot of mi like p misinformed patients. You know, you brought up an excellent point, Matt, because like how... How I always mention is like, it's a chronic disease that's easy to treat, easy in diabetes. That may be true for me as the provider, yeah. but it may not be the truth for the patient. Right. You know, I think a couple of times I always touch base with them is just that they can tell you the exact date that they were diagnosed. Mm -hmm. They can tell you the exact situation that they were in when they were diagnosed. And for many, it was really, really traumatic, actually. You yeah. know, it was in a very awkward situation or the other thing was the involvement with the healthcare system at that time, or it was like a complete shock. So like, it's very easy for me to say, hey, it's easy to take a pill every day. For some, it's it's really not. Yeah. So that's why I really try to get a sense of like, what is their understanding of their disease and how do they view themselves um, overall during the visit? I, and this this is fairly granular, and uh, but I, I wonder how do you, 
document in the in the record sort of who knows about the diagnosis and who can be disclosed to i feel like I, I don't know about you all but i've i've been involved in teams where there's been sort of catastrophic disclosure of diagnoses to family members who didn't know or that kind of thing so is there a way to to sort of safely sort of share that information so that you're protecting the patient the way they need to be protected yeah i, I try to keep it in my um my note i think i try to forward with every part of my note um, part of the HIV initial history so that if anyone's pulling up the chart, I also try to use st stickies if we can. So my previous medical records, you can actually put it so it comes up as a as a pop-up that you can make sure that they're not aware of the diagnosis. Um, hmm. I know CERN, our, sorry, our medical record here has that option too. I just assume that no one knows and you shouldn't assume that anyone does. And I think also when you're seeing patients in the hospitalized setting, you just assume that someone in the room does not know, actually, because um, I've had similar instances where they were accidentally disclosed in front, in front of people that didn't know. Thank you for not mentioning the medical record by name. We we bleep that on the show. Actually, a past guest complained to Paul and I because we bleeped them because they said the medical record name so many times that their colleagues were like, why are you swearing so much on curbsiders? Yeah. And he's like, I wasn't swearing. I was saying the name of a medical record. Yeah, listen, until they sponsor us. Anyway, you know, yeah. They're not getting free press from us. All right, Paul, should we move on with the case? We should probably move on with the case. All right. So, Mr. Jones, in terms of getting your excellent history, he tells you that he was diagnosed with HIV three years ago. He states that his viral load is undetectable. He believes his CD4 count was, quote, pretty good at last check approximately six months ago. He is without any other medical issues other than occasional seasonal allergies. He states that his parents are in good health. He reports occasional alcohol use, smokes cannabis daily, and denies other substance use. He is sexually active with two male partners and engages in receptive and penetrative anal and oral sex, endorsing routine barrier protection. He reports a prior history of chlamydia infection about nine months ago, and then again two years uh, prior to that. Works as a graphic designer currently and lives alone. We'll, we'll get into some of the, the social history and some of the management stuff, um, but I, I did want to give a space to at least talk about your initial physical examination, if this diagnosis changes anything that you would do, or if it's just sort of your routine bread and butter Sure. I think a lot of it's visualization, um, actually just like looking at the patient. If they seem anxious, you know, overall, that gives me some kind of things to kind of look for. Also, the things I'm looking for during my history, and even though it's part of the I'm physical, you know, I always do like a full review of symptoms because it might get kind of gears me if there's issues with adherence. Um, things I'm looking for really um, is if there's been any weight loss, any night sweats, any fevers, you know, have they noticed any um, lymphadenopathy overall? Because it might gear to me on what I'm going to focus on on my necessarily exam as well. And then thinking about the sexual history, actually, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but I think one of the big things is if they're having any active symptoms, because again, you know, one of the big things I try to do on the exam is make sure that, you know, we're not missing anything on a diagnosis. And then for the physical exam, you know, really just like I, I tell the residents, it's it's really just head to toe. But, you know, a couple things for me to kind of keep an eye on is if there's weight loss, if the patient looks um, cacactic. I think other things, if there's visual field deficits, you know, the rooms have ophthalmoscopes. We can use them, reminding them that they're there other than paperweights. Um, you know, I do a good full skin exam, lymphadenopathy, and then depending on patient preference and reading the room, unless there's an active symptom that's concerning for me for an STD, I also m make sure that I try to do a um, uh, sexual health exam as well, but that might also be determined by patient comfort. I, and you mentioned looking for cachexia and everything, but one thing that I was... No, I guess not as aware of uh, like people with med screening for metabolic syndrome or just like weight gain on medications. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little yeah. bit? That wasn't really on my radar. To totally. So like also part of my exam is looking through the vitals and then also looking for like anything that's suggestive of metabolic syndrome. So why is that? Because I think, you know, patients had mentioned that there has been weight gain with certain HIV medications. And I think a lot of times back in my day as a trainee and as a, as a student and as a fellow, we used to always mention that, you know, HIV is this catabolic state. You're undetectable. You lose fat deposits. You know, you're on medications. That's why you're gaining weight. Although, you know, since there's been newer um, treatment options, which is awesome in the sense that they're easier to take, has less reportable side effects, they suppress the virus really well, we're learning a lot about our patients on these new medications. And I think there's been a lot of association with weight gain as well. And when we look at that, it's, it's also not necessarily equal, actually. So I, I remember reading something where about one in six patients within the next two years will gain 10% of their body weight actually starting on antiretrovirals. And when you split that even more, the weight gain's even higher in African-Americans. 
and especially African-American uh, women. So ne nearly 20% of patients. And some of these studies, I think the one I remember is like the advanced uh, trial noticed that there was about a weight gain about up to 6.4 kilos. So, you know, is it part of the medications? It could be. I think some of the newer formulations, um, you know, when, you know, we used to use a lot of tenofovir disoproxyl, we kind of advanced to tenofovir alafinamide. You know, we're noticing that there is some weight gain and there might be even more concurrent weight gain with some of the integrase inhibitors. So when we're thinking of dalatagravir or bictagravir. So it's something to kind of think of console. So as exam wise, it's important to note, to, to keep an eye on that because there is going to be some weight gain. And I think preparing patients for that, if you want to talk about adherence is important. What what do you do in terms of mitigation strategies for that? I mean, I, I know we're, this is not the episode for yeah. initiation of therapy, but I guess if you were at that point, like, is it just a anticipatory guidance? Is there how do you how do you talk to that with patients? You know, I think I've changed my focus on a couple things. I think one, I really think about talking about like diet and nutrition very early on, and then again, it's really not just that; it's really checking if there's access to healthy food. So, like, I think if that's an issue with that with patients, I might tie that in with my case manager or local resources to kind of focus on that. I think. Um, three, try to really form and talk about physical activity. When I talk about physical activity, that's another kind of sneaky way I kind of find out safety of the neighborhood because like there are some neighborhoods where it's not super safe to go um, exercise outside. It also has made me rethink sometimes med switches. So a lot of times, you know, the thought process is a newer medication comes out, super great, less side effects, you know, but if my patient haven't had issues to change them, you know, sometimes it's conversations now that I initiate that, hey, there's this newer option, but let's sit down if this is the right option for you. So I've been like rethinking some of the um, initiations and switches uh, overall. Or if I do switch, recommend mentioning that this may be something that note that we will know, actually. Uh, for the for the patients that I've had some patients recently tell me that they started doing like YouTube workouts because, yeah. you know, like Peloton, all those things are expensive, uh, un unattainable for a lot of patients, but like there's free workouts on YouTube and things. And same thing, patients are like, my neighborhood's too dangerous. So I don't, I, I don't walk around or during the, the pandemic, people weren't comfortable going outside. So now they're, they're doing that. I, I did want to ask you uh, switch. Is it, is it okay to talk about labs now, Paul? Are we moving into the initial labs or we have something else? I, I can save my question. Well, I guess while we're here uh, in sort of metabolic land, I guess there are any other considerations. I know that it's, I hear some rumblings about sort of screening and diagnosing um, diabetes and sort of choosing labs for that and timing of the initiation of ART and that kind of stuff. Is there anything that that might be a little bit more nuanced than we need here? But from a primary care standpoint, is there anything that we should know about specifically between HIV, its treatments and, and diabetes? Yeah, I think as part of the f one thing that's really interesting and, you know, it's I'm happy to have patients that are living longer lives. I'm happy for the day they're cured and I lose my job. I tell them I'll cry <laughs> tears of joy with that. But, you know, there is a uh, risk for cardiovascular disease about two times higher in patients living with HIV, even being undetectable um, and higher CD4 counts. So I think as we look back at that, there's some kind of big focus points for melabotic syndrome. You know, I think one of the things is really being aggressive to screen for diabetes. I think also making sure that lipid profiles that we're not just checking them, we're actually treating them, actually. So as we're thinking about things, you know, I have many patients who are super well controlled um, for the HIV, their diabetes needs a little bit of help actually. And I think one of the big things as I focus on that is highlighting that that's probably just as important or even more important for mortality um, overall than necessarily just treating your HIV. So I think I tend to do a lot more screening. And then as I'm thinking about my antiretrovirals, you know, as we talk about switches, you know, it's important to think of what medication interactions there might be. You know, I think one of the big things is making sure that if a patient needs to be on a statin medication to really think about that. And you can't just go by the ACCVD risk factor in our patients who are living with HIV because we're not actually part of the calculation. We know there's a risk. So like, uh, you know, as I discuss with my patients why I'm doing stuff. And I think one of the big things is for my patients is I, f I feel a lot of times overall, both non-HIV, more meds. I'm always pushing meds, right? They want less meds. But I try to really focus that, hey, if you have a heart attack, there's going to be about three or four meds I'm going to add on to your med list that probably won't go off. Yeah. And I think like, you know, that's if you have a minor heart attack with no dysfunction after. 
And then for, um, so for us, for mostly taking off the patients for boosters for cholesterol medications, if we can, um, some of the protease inhibitors can cause dyslipidemia. The newer ones, not as much, but compared to the integrase inhibitors, they tend to be pretty lipid neutral. Mm -hmm. um, but my dosing for um, the statins can be contraindication. I have to start with a lower dose and make sure that they're not having any side effects. And the statins we tend to use is resuvastatin or torvastatin overall. For diabetes management, um, some of the longer-acting integrase inhibitors actually do interact with metformin, so the dosing should probably be a little bit lower. So thinking about delatagravir and bictagravir. Um, but, you know, I think one of the big things is just making sure that as a provider, we're doing just as updated care for HIV for their primary care. So, like, if they really are indicated to get a GLP-1 for diabetes, really thinking about that. If they need the statin, really thinking about that um, overall. So, I tend to be pretty aggressive on that. And same thing for blood pressure control. Do you have any preferred resources for the statin interactions, or do you just note these off the top of your head at this point? Um, I always double check. Great, you know, thank you. I think I always <laughs> double check. You know, there's a couple great resources. I think uh, University of Washington has this like self-study module for HIV and um, also HIV in primary care. It's free. Yeah. It's amazing. They also have one for Hep C. Um, UCSF also has one where I think they're just revamping the website because it's been off for about a uh, year and it's called the Knowledge Link. And it's great because like it's all topics necessarily all towards there. Those are my kind of... Um, go-to ones. And then I know I'm digressing a little bit, but I think as I talk about my patients is really focus on smoking because there's a much higher prevalence of smoking in patients living with HIV. And I, I describe it as, you know, a couple years ago, our journal, Clinical Infectious Disease, had a article on smoking and smoking um, conversations to have with patients, reviewing their treatments for patients, you know, a, pretty much a primary care article in a infectious disease journal. And I think it just shows that the prevalence of smoking is much, much higher. Yeah. The the quit line in, in the state of Pennsylvania is great. They yeah. give five free coaching sessions and they'll, they'll send pa patients patches and then either gum or lozenges for free. So it's it's a fantastic yeah. resource. And I, I think it's a national resource. I think you, you if you call, you actually get a person too. So I would recommend people just even call it yourself just to see like what experience the patients got. I've, I've done it and it's, uh, it is, is very helpful. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask a little bit about, um, or no, I'm sorry. I wanted to note the Liverpool calculator. Isn't that the one that like all the ID docs, I think it's been mentioned on the show before. I think for, they have one for hep C for HIV and for, uh, the COVID medications. Yeah, I think. And, so. and thank you for bringing that back up because that one's also very helpful source. I've used it a lot during uh, COVID, especially just to check for the Paxlovid interactions. Yeah. All right, Paul, where, where to next? Well, it's Valentine's Day. I mean, we should probably, um, uh, well, actually, <laughs> oh, it is Valentine's Day. Happy is. Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, thanks to you too, buddy. Um, so actually, let's let's talk about because I do want to make space for this too about um, the conversations about transmissibility um, in relation to say viral load and CD4 counts or what's what's the current thinking the current counseling can we I just want to make sure that we talk about the U equals U before we move past it into the other screenings. Yeah, so I think this was big when um, this came out with uh, CDC. I think there was many studies that were already super suggestive of this. You know, there was a study which I can't remember all. I think it was HPTN zero five two. You might quote me on that one. I should know. <laughs> that one, but I think overall I was looking at serial discordant couples, and what they noticed in serial discordant couple, one living with HIV, one without, is that the patient, as long as the patient was undetectable, actually did not contract, uh, was, was unable to transmit HIV. And there's been several iterations of it from different parts. There's the partner studies and the partner two studies that looked at more diversified patient populations, and same thing. So when we're looking at um, patients at MSM or gay, bisexual, they were able to explicate uh, extrapolate that as well, that U equals U. So really thinking about treatment is not just treatment, it's also preventive. So that's why I think a lot of our treatment options have um, really focusing on starting medications very early on. It's crazy. Like 10 years ago, I would wait till their A defining illness. It's just talking about this. Right? Yeah. yeah. When, I was a, when I was a resident, I think the SMART trial came out. So it was like CD4 500. Yeah. And, you know, really talking about the rapid initiation and really bringing down that viral load as, as quick as often. And there's a lot of stuff from uh, UCSF also looking at bringing down that viral load very quickly with same day initiation. You just got to remember there's some patients that you may want to do that too. There might be others that you want to be careful on, mm. actually. I, yeah. And 
I, I wanted to, you know, this is something I do on the show from time to time. So I, uh, maybe I'll, tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. I might be wrong. Feel free to shoot this down. He's, he's going to be wrong, by the way. We, <laughs> <laughs> we should just check the CD4 count. That's still most important. And we should just check it like every month or so for just the entire time the person has HIV. How, what's the current thinking on that? Am I, am I up to date? Uh, so, you know, <laughs> we, we'll check a CD4 count initially as a uh, baseline when we're thinking of um, treatment naive, mostly to give us an idea of, you know, if there's issues with us to think about for opportunistic uh, infections prophylaxis. Um, you know, the absolute number is what my patients are so on and remember. But to me, just as important as the CD4 counts, the percent, because the absolute number can change. Someone mm -hmm. can be ill, hospitalized with a pneumonia, come in with a colitis, that absolute number can come down. But the percent tends to be less variable for how often we check it. So, you know, I usually will check it within, you know, three to six months in the initial part. Um, as patients who've been undetectable for greater than two years, I've sometimes just switched to once once yearly. Actually, it also is patient-driven. There are some patients that are really, that is super important for yeah. them mm -hmm. to know. So I, I think, you know, that's something that I keep in mind. Probably my depends well. on when they were diagnosed too, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, we we had talked years ago with uh, the, Michael Sag, and he was just like, yeah, viral load is what's important now, suppressing that. Yeah. Once someone's viral load suppressed and their CD4s is greater than 500 and stable for years, like, you, you, you know, checking it has minimal value at that point if they're oh, staying on their meds. And but. I would agree with that. I, I think some reporting that some funding comes from different states for like our Ryan Wright program still. They still on, want that. I still oh, want that. But, you know, I think I agree with that. To me, the bigger thing is making sure that the viral load, and yeah. that's what I'm going to be checking more often, especially I want to make sure that's dropping within a log, actually. And with the introduction in integrase inhibitors, it does. Where I get worried is if it's not. And that's when you got to start thinking about, hey, you know, where are there barriers for um, adherence? Is there some underlying resistance yeah. that I might see? Um, and that's where I might focus on. But one thing I forgot to mention, even as I'm having this discussion with this patient too, is, you know, taking a really good um, sexual history because one of the big things I want to make sure is that, you know, if their patient partners get offered PrEP or discussions about HIV PrEP, and I know you guys done talks on HIV PrEP, I won't focus so much on that. And then um, also take a really good sexual history as well. Yeah. So before, actually, I would like to hear sort of what your sexual history sounds like before we get there yeah. and before we leave this slide. Is there a recommended duration of time for someone to be undetectable before you can sort of say with confidence, okay, equals you, is there, is there guidance, recommendation age for that? Is one lab sufficient? Sort of how, what's the, the timing about that? So, you know, back what I always remember when I'm talking about family planning, I would like to make sure that they're undetectable for at least six months. Um, but I think, honestly, the data suggests that if they've been undetectable with viral loads less than, um, you know, being detectable, it, it reduces the chance. Okay. And I know that you'd wanted to talk about your, your sexual health history. I, this is, this feels like the right time. So I, I always say that the greatest thing I've ever had to honestly was working with a young patient population. Cause like they really broke me down in the sense of like terms, lingo, like everything. <laughs> and I still learn so much from them. I, I have a, it's, it's a joy taking care of them. Um, I always think if there's a, actually an insert from like the CDC, and it's really thinking about like the five P's. Now, I don't always remember all the P's, but it's still, it's still good. <laughs> so I think one is like looking at practice. So like, you know, what is their practice? So I usually will go in, like I, I always start off with like, I have no assumptions, just tell me. Like, you know, what preference of partners do you have? Trans me female, bi, um, you know, overall, how do you practice? Top, bottom, verse. Um, usually I preface this by, this is important for me to think about for testing. So like, I usually will preface that from that. Sometimes I'll even ask them, you know, have they been tested in that mo uh, modality before um, overall? I think the next thing I uh, kind of get to is number of partners within the last three to six months. So again, it gives me an idea of how often to do STD screening, uh, making sure that that's offered. And then also thinking about HIV prep, if there's like also partners that they're necessarily having that might be interested um, in that as well. You know, I think um, also uh, prior history. So again, knowing if they had previous histories of STDs, mostly to make sure that they get tested more frequently. And then also to make sure that they're getting tested correctly. A lot of times I see the primary care providers, amazing. They'll do a good job of screening. They forget to check syphilis. So like a lot of times I'll see like the urine and the swab, but I won't see the um, RPR actually. So just there's higher rates of syphilis um, uh, as, as expected. And then one other thing that might be a little bit different in my patient population is hep C. So there's been some, um, 
um, data looking at um, sexual transmission, mostly in um, MSM. So there's been thoughts that screen hep C might want to have a discussion with patients to screen yearly, actually. So that might be something else in my practice. And making sure they're immune for hep B is also a part of my practice. So like looking through all these is making sure that if we do have the swabs to do rectal and pharyngeal testing, that should be included um, as well, because we'll catch more cases that way. Yeah, we learned that. Uh, we, we did a STI episode years ago, and I again, was embarrassed to not know that. I was just like, oh, do the urine nucleic acid amplification test and I'm good to go. And our guest is like, no, you miss a ton if you do that. Like you have to ask them like, how are you having sex? You know, if and then you have to do rectal swabs or pharyngeal swabs, as you just said, um, as well, if if that's happening. So I, I think that's, that's, we can't say that enough so that people remember to do that. What else, Paul? Um, I, I wanted to ask about... Well, actually, I guess let's get into the labs first. So it's we we have some of these up here. Um, hopefully, they're they're reasonably accurate. But I guess, um, now let me go back to my original question. I heard rumblings about doxycycline for sort of STI prep. Can you talk to me where where are we at with that? How should we be thinking about that? Is that something that is commonly used? Sure. Uh, when I was in Philadelphia, you know, there was an arm of the Ipergay study that looked at doxycycline to look at reducing the cases of syphilis and chlamydia. Um, you know, as the advent of HIV prep, great in preventing um, HIV expectations that there's been higher cases of STD, especially in certain patient populations where there's just much, much higher cases um, overall. The thought process is that uh, it's it's really thinking about it like post-exposure prophylaxis um, because what they're looking at is providing doxycycline, which is 200 milligrams within, you wanna do it within 24 hours, but up to 72 hours after a condomless sexual activity. And what they noticed is that it actually decreased uh, syphilis cases and chlamydia cases. Um, UCSF in their state health department, I thought, had just come out with a study because it was kind of mentioned in the International AIDS Conference from last summer, actually looking at doxycycline. And they were only looking at it for MSM. So it's only really MSM, um, it's uh, cis men or trans females to think about when we're, we're talking about doxy prep, actually. And what they're, although there's ongoing studies looking at it for cis females um, as well. But what they noticed was that it reduced STDs, but up to 66%. And as a former, before um, ID fellowship, I was an epidemiologist. And I can tell you, I've never done syphilis contact tracings, but I've done other contact tracings. It takes up a lot of time and resources to really find patient zeros. So like when you're trying to find and track cases of syphilis, you know, how much resources are spent, you know, thinking about conversations about doxy pep might mm. be something to actually talk about. And, and this is a daily doxy like dose. So there's to there's two different ways. So um, most ways I've used it is mostly as post exposure prophylaxis. So 200 milligrams within the 72 hours. Really try to put it 24 hours. There's other studies that are coming from Canada and Australia that are both looking at both pep and doxy prep hmm. um, as well. So there might be stuff coming about because next week is our big retrovirus and opportunistic conference, which is a mouthful. So we just call it <laughs> Croy. So Croy, so and there might the, be some updates. By the time this airs, we might have to update the show. You'll let us yeah. know if yeah, we yeah, need yeah, to yeah. update yeah. the show notes by the time this airs. But the question comes on who to think about it. So when I was in Philadelphia, I remember the health department meeting with us and just talking about how much resources they use for syphilis testing. And there had been discussions and reflections on should we be thinking about doxypep. So it's a conversation that I've had for my patients. I think of any patients that had more than one or two STDs actually within a year, um, especially if, if it was syphilis, actually. So it's like one of the big things that I have had discussions with. The controversy or the part that not know in that study, the most recent one was there was more resistance to gonorrhea. Like it reduced it, I think, by 50%. Yeah, we don't want super gonorrhea <laughs> to get any more prevalent <laughs> but, than it. But the, the, the caveat is that we don't really use tetracycline for gonorrhea treatment. But the question is, well, will it change the biome or resistance for other stuff that we use doxycycline for, right? So when we think about staph infections and stuff like that. So I think there's still a lot of data. So like CDC's inputs like, hey, it can be used off-label, but there still need a lot of data. Well, I, I wanted to ask, because uh, we, we do want to leave time for audience questions. I know we, we have a lot of other stuff to test for. I, I did or ask about, I did want to ask about anal cancer screening, because that's, I think, probably most primary care docs are 
less familiar with that and talking about doing digital rectal exams and anal paps. Uh, are, are you doing those in the office? Like who's who's doing those? Should primary cares be doing those if their patient's not seeing an HIV specialist yearly? Sure. sure. Yeah, I've, I've been um, doing uh, anal pap um, screening. You know, I did a lot of it before coming to Penn State Hershey. Um, some the issue sometimes I worry is that you know the costs of the testing for patients prior. But you know, I think a lot of things have swayed in the last couple of years. Um, last year at Croy, the Anchor study kind of gave out some preliminary results looking at anal you know, cancer screening. So I'm trying to remember what the Anchor study stands for, but I think it's like anal cancer, high grade intra. High grade squamous intra epithelial lesions. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's probably but, a cardiology trial. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what they were looking at was uh, they were screening patients over the age of 35. Um, they had both men and women, trans female, trans males um, as well. And they were looking through and seeing if, you know, if a patient tested positive for a high grade lesion, should they just take it out or should they just monitor it? And the study actually had closed early. It was between 15 different sites overall in the US. And just because there was clear benefit necessarily from it. So it's something that I've been um, doing a lot more in my patient practice and having that discussion um, overall. So, and I've caught a lot of high grade lesions. And then the, after that, really tying them for the endoscopy or colorectal to take a look to make sure if there's any suspicious lesions. And then after that, follow up with colorectal. And any resources for like people, I, I mean, it's, I, I don't think I, I did not learn how to do that. And I know I did not yeah. learn how to do that in training. So what resources are there for people if they have to learn how to do anal Yeah. Pap so there's uh, what we call, there's a wonderful uh, iteration and, and stuff from like some of the health departments overall. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds more difficult than it is. It's just, it's just a brush actually um, over on. You're trying to get around the Z line and putting pressure as you, you go in, put pressure mm -hmm. as you go in and then just spin as you go out. But you know, it's been, you can Google it. There's many different things in, yeah. in PDF. And patients over. can't self-swab for that. Like they That's can one where we don't recommend necessarily okay. self-swabbing. And then sometimes also thinking, uh, you know, rectal exam, digital exam, just making sure you're not missing the lesion from the brush. So those are things I've had discussions with my patients and recognize that overall, you know, they may not want to do that at the moment, or I don't save it for the first visit. It might be stuff as we yeah. develop rapport. Okay, great. And along those lines for cervical cancer screening, I know things are a little bit different for patients living with HIV. You don't have to go too, too granular, but like any any big differences between um, anything that you would do differently for someone who is living with HIV than someone who is, who is not? Yeah, so I think, you know, if I remember correctly from the primary care guidelines, usually age 65, you would necessarily stop for cervical cancer screening in patients not living with HIV. And persons living with HIV, actually it's, it's, it goes on past that. So um, overall, um, also depends, you know, we try to do it within the first time of diagnosis, but still go by the guidelines. So not nothing earlier than necessarily 21. And then I always have to look at the flow chart overall to make sure that yeah. I remember, but you know, you know, that excellent chart up there that you're showing hides it. Okay. Well. So Paul, I think, you know, we, we should leave a few minutes for audience questions. We have some time left, but what else do you definitely want to get to? I know, I know we've got into a lot of the stuff on here already. I think the things I want to hit for sure, any differences in vaccines. And then I think we, we should probably finish up with sort of the futures, the injectable stuff. Cause I feel like that's an important conversation Great. to have. So why don't we, any, any difference in terms of vaccine considerations for someone with a diagnosis of HIV? Yeah, I think as I think about um, necessarily vaccines, you know, making sure that they're definitely screened for um, hep A and hep B. So making sure that they're hep A and hep B immune. Actually, again, for uh, prevention for as an STD, but also co-infection, there's worse liver with co-infection. You know, streptococcus pneumonia. So like really thinking about strep pneumo vaccination, it's actually um, indicated there's higher Which rates. Which ones? Right, I always, yeah, same thing. So, uh, you know, usually I start off with like the PCV um, 15 and then 20, Three, no. Yeah, I got to look. I, I, again, it's it's changed so much uh, recently. And, yeah. it, you know, I usually... 23, yeah. 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 And then the other things to think about meningococcal, we'll vaccinate every five years for meningococcal. And then even when I was looking at that ACIP guidelines, you know, thinking about uh, recombinant um, zoster as well. So... Yeah, I know they're trying to simplify. They tried to simplify the the pneumococcal guidelines, but I still think it's still because there's been so many changes in quick succession, and there's two new vaccines, the two new Prevnars. I feel it's still confused, and people are still confused. Patients are like, "Didn't I already have two pneumonia vaccines?" So anyway, I'm on your side about. I'm on Team JJ for this one. 
I'm genuinely angry about the pneumococcal vaccinations, <laughs> which is not great for my patients. Well, you know, I think like there's still some tables that I have where I usually sit in my pod in clinic and I'm like, yes, I'm still up to date on that one. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's talk about I was excited. I think the first I heard about this was last year at probably ACP talking about the injectable medicine, both for prep and for just like once was it, what is it once every eight weeks injectable and they don't have to take a daily pill. Can you talk about this? Is this uh, what are there any barriers to this? Any downsides to this? So I think this has been really exciting. You know, a lot of patients had here had been hearing rumblings for quite a while. You know, as I mentioned to you, it's very easy for me to come in and go, hey, take your medication every day. It's easy. But, you know, I have patients that it's a constant reminder, right, of their diagnosis necessarily. Mm -hmm. I have patients that hide their pills or their um, transitional housing in between. So, like, not making sure that they don't want anyone to know that they necessarily have um, HIV. And then I have other patients that have just trouble taking pills. So when this came out, it was really awesome to kind of really talk about um, different treatment options overall. One of the big things is it can't be used with hep B, so they have to um, be hepatitis B um, can't have chronic hepatitis B as we tend to use tenofovir a lot for um, hep D um, infections. But, you know, I think it's been really revolutionary and really giving some of the autonomy back to the um, patient that they don't have to take a daily pill. When they were looking at the studies, there's two, actually one we're looking at it monthly, the other looked at higher dosing and providing like the first shot, then the second shot, and then after that, every two months. And patients did well. They, you know, there was... Le um, not as many breakthroughs overall from um, becoming detectable. So I think it's a really effective tool in our toolbox. A couple of caveats to it is that it has to be done in a medical visit. So because it's a gluteal um, injection, actually it has to be done. And I always tell us that commercial is awesome. They, I love the commercials. Commercials doesn't tell you that it's actually two shots. <laughs> so like huh. actually as, huh. as, you're, as you're selling it with uh, with the patients overall. So Wait, like the, two shots on, two shots on one, the same one, day? Yeah. So one one per... Gluteal uh. cheek. <laughs> so, like, as I, like I just you started with gluteal and then still went with cheek at yes. the end. Like, you, you start out medical and then just kind of. <laughs> Sorry, it's, you know, it's how I talk about it with my patients. But you know, I think one of the big things to really highlight um, overall from it is, you know, from the patients I've had transition, they they've absolutely loved it. I mean, I think one of the big things that um, really want to try to make sure as I'm is I need to have a way to find our patient, and I think that's the hard part sometimes is like uh, you know you have to be remember have to remember to come back to get that second um, shot. You know we have a little bit of a win window or wiggle room, but the always concerning part is if you pass that window and the levels are starting to come down and we're promoting resistance, actually. So, you know, I've been having uh, my patients do it. We try to track it as best as we can, but I think sometimes it's just that might be a barrier to think about as implementing is really the, the patient follow-up and retention. And then the other thing I mentioned is that um, injectable rapivirine, so I also do a lot of methadone, so like injectable rapivirine can actually prolong QTC. So like one thing to remember is that if there's other QTC prolonging agents to make sure there's a baseline EKG. and um, cabotagravir can actually interact with methadone, so it can actually lower the dose. So it's something to think about um, when you're discussing if they're getting methadone um, with their site to make sure that they're monitoring for any withdrawal symptoms um, overall. And logistically with these, do you do an oral run-in period for, for tolerance? Like are the oral medications first and then transition to the injections? Or so what does this look like? I know probably more than I need to know specifically. No, no. So it's a great question. Um, for some patients, you know, if I haven't done an oral lead-in, you don't necessarily have to do the oral lead-in if you're doing a switch. Actually, and they're undetectable. Um, they tolerate it well. For patients where I've had a lot of issue with medication side effects, I'll still do an oral lead in mm. just to make sure that they're not having any side effects. So I've had patients where we cycled through many different antiretrovirals um, overall, and that might be the time that I'll talk about it. The other thing is just remembering that they can't have an NRTI resistance. So if they um, have resistance to repivirine, it's not an option. If there's a lot of integrase inhibitor resistance, it's not an option. Um, but I think it's a good discussion to have with, the, with our patients um, overall. And then the exciting part of cabotagravir as well is thinking at it as an option for PrEP. Yeah. All right. Well, should we take, I think we should probably take questions from the audience. Sure. We might, we might probably only have time for maybe like one or so, but, uh, we'll, we'll just call on you and we'll, re we'll, we'll repeat it for the people in the audience. So does anybody have any questions? If not, that's okay. We're happy to just, you know, get some take home points and get y'all out of here. So the question was, is there a PAP equivalent for, uh, HPV related cancer screening? Uh, I believe, you know, I, I believe so. I, I, you know, I think, yeah, 
It, it's okay if the answer I, I don't is think, we're not I, sure. I, I, that's okay. I would say I'm not as sure for that, so I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. But that is a great that. question. Yeah, yeah I, I know people. I, I have had patients ask me that question. They're worried about it. I think some celebrity has, you know, uh, head and neck cancer from HPV, and it, people are now aware that that could be a thing. Yep. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a class. Just the furious avoidance of eye contact is my favorite thing about medical education. All right. But we, we, could, we could end on time. Let's get some take-home points. Like, people, we, we've talked about a lot today. I mean, we've done hero's work, as always. As always. Uh, but uh, if there was, like, maybe a couple things, one, two, three things you wanted the audience to remember, what, what would those be? You know, I think uh, just making sure that we're balancing patient expectations and what they're looking for and primary care, recognizing that barriers that they may have experienced. Um, I think that's something to kind of really think about as we work with our patient populations. The second thing that drives me crazy is um, the expectation that, you know, if patients are late, we just reschedule. We have no clue how our, our patient's journey to come to our clinic or practice that day. And you don't know the competing factors that they're necessarily having. So I think one of the big things is just being slightly flexible. Um, and I think one of the big things is recognizing that when patient asks questions that if you don't know the answer, you know, just making sure that you can either refer or touch base with much smarter colleagues um, overall and not ignoring that. And I bring that up because a lot of times, you know, we've always talked about patients mentioning, hey, I'm gaining weight, I'm gaining weight, and I'm gaining weight. And then now there's like a lot of data suggesting that, hey, it's true, you gained weight on your medication. So I think mm -hmm. listening to the patients overall. And we will be back with our lightning round. All right, so before, JJ, these people know you, uh, but maybe they don't have a time to talk to you about like you know, some of the more fun stuff. So maybe give them a pick, give them a pick of the week. What are you enjoying these days and that you would recommend to them and, and to the audience at home listening to this after the fact? So if <clears throat> I kind of want to seem like I'm sophisticated, so I probably might start off with an actual book. I do love to read. I wish I could say something like memoirs or biographies or like stuff, but it's usually sci-fi. So I think right now I'm reading The Wandering Earth, which is really good. It's about moving this planet as our sun is dying. It's very depressing, but very good. <laughs> Sounds right up my alley. Yeah. Depression sci-fi is like my specific niche, so I'll have to check it out. And then realistically, probably the uh, playing video games is my, you know, my, my stress reliever and mass effect. I'm really enjoying that. Okay. Is that available on Switch? Not, not at the moment. Yeah, I probably won't check that out then because, uh, yeah, PS5 is still hard to come by, maybe. I it's, don't know. It's, it's fine. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy? I mean, it could have been your chance to shine. Do you want to say, do you want to yummy? <laughs> I'm okay. In front of your colleagues? I mean, you can right here. <laughs> I'm okay. Great. All right. Missed opportunity, buddy. All right. Get your show notes to thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high value practice changing knowledge. And we'd also like your feedback. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show. You can you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You can also email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. And I wanted to give a special thanks to the great Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, America's primary care doctor. <laughs> Doctor, uh, and to uh, Dr. Beth Garbs Garbatelli for helping to write this episode. The Curbsiders uh, technical production is done by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto and Jen R Watto run our social media, and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. I do want to throw in a quick thanks for Dr. Ellen Tadaldi, who actually is one of my like legit heroes, um, who's at Temple right now, who actually looked over the script and gave me some ideas. So I, I just want to say thank you to her, and then also just ask for another round of applause to the great Dr. Nunez before they say I'm Paul Williams. Thanks, guys.